Welcome to the Shame Free Zone. I am very honored to have a special guest. His name is Dr. Barry Komisarik, and his research is rather legendary in my circles as a sexologist. And he is a distinguished professor and co author of a book called The Science of Orgasm. Today, we're going to be talking about a lot of things pertaining to sexual stimulation of the vagina. And I can't wait for us to dive into that. Thank you so much for joining me in the Shame Free Zone, Barry. Thank you for your interest in our work. Yes. Well, and I should say that you actually co-authored that book, The Science of Orgasm, with Beverly Whipple. Isn't that true? Yes. Yeah. I think I think there might have been one other name on that, but I wasn't familiar with it. Did you want to Carlos call that Beyer. out? Yeah. Carlos Bayer. Who? Who Carlos Bayer. Uh, Carlos Bayer, uh, who's, yes. Um, who was a um, world-famous neuroendocrinologist, and we worked together for many, many years. He was um, actually won the uh, uh, president's, uh, presidential prize for science in uh, Mexico. He was a very eminent uh, scientist. Talk and about him in past different. tense, so I'm going to guess that he's uh, passed on. Yes, a few years ago. Okay, sorry about that. Beverly is uh, pretty renowned in sex circles as well, written quite a few books on the topic of sex. How did you guys meet and team up to do your research uh, together? That's a, it's an interesting story. Uh, uh, I was at a, uh, a, a conference. I gave a, a paper at a conference, uh, actually the, the first world sexology conference in Jerusalem in, in uh, 1982. And she uh, read the abstracts and said that she, because I talked about vaginal stimulation blocking pain in laboratory animals. And, um, and she, uh, she uh, sent me an email uh, when I got back home and said that she, could I send her the abstract? And, uh, and I, I knew what, what she had done because uh, she, she had just written the, uh, the G-spot. And I was teaching a course in human sexuality at Rutgers. Uh, so I invited, I asked her if she would come and give a seminar. Uh, so she came, she came to Newark with a bodyguard. <laughs> she, I don't know. Oh my God. Who, I don't know who, really? who she didn't trust more. She, I don't know if she didn't trust me or if she didn't trust Newark, but she had a bodyguard and she gave a seminar. And then she told me, that she, she was a, uh, she was a, uh, on the uh, uh, nursing faculty at Gloucester County College in South Jersey. Uh, so, um, uh, she said that uh, she uh, uh, would like to get some formal training in research. She did uh, some research for the uh, for the book, the G Spot, but she wanted to get some formal training. And and I said, well, you know, I um, uh, I, I found I did all this uh, neurophysiological research and showing that vaginal stimulation blocks pain in rats. But the the most scientific answer I could get was by asking women. And uh, would you be interested in she wanted to learn how to do research. I said, would you be interested in um, uh, doing a study on vaginal self-stimulation of women uh, uh, on pain, pain thresholds uh, for your doctoral dissertation? So she said, yes. So she became my doctoral student. Wow. And she, was, she, did, a, um, uh, 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 she did that for her doctoral dissertation with me. Uh, in record time, which was only two and a half years, she worked feverishly. Uh, Brilliant she woman. Was she was very, very, very organized, incredibly organized, and hardworking. And so she finished. She, she and that that became. And then um, she um, uh, she did so well that she got uh, an offer on the um, faculty, the uh, nursing faculty uh, at Newark. Uh, at Rutgers Newark, where, where where my lab was, is, and um, so she she was on the faculty for many years, and oh. then she retired. Uh, oh. But so we we uh, we worked together for many years on on a number of different uh, publications, and the book. Well, I have to ask you, what was it that caused you to go towards? Vaginal stimulation is a potential way to block pain. Because I know you was, first started in. Purely okay, tell. What, I you can't see, wait what to hear. Okay. Um, 
this is, you know, um, <clears throat> what I, uh, what I did for my doctoral dissertation, I was intrigued by, of 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 finding that if putting a cr crystal of estrogen into the hypothalamus, this was a, a, a recent recent study um, that actually I was taking an undergraduate course uh, uh, at at City College. I was a I was a uh, an undergraduate at City College, and there was a visiting professor Danny Lehrman, who gave a uh, gave a, gave a course on structure and function of the organism, and he talked about this recent work of, of uh, a couple of people, one in cats and one in rats, where they put a crystal of estrogen in the hypothalamus in, in the female and turned on sex behavior. And I said, that's really intriguing. How could a chemical, just a, a crystal of a hormone, turn on a complex behavior pattern? And he said, how would you like to do that for your doctoral dissertation with me? So that wow. was, a, that was a, an offer I couldn't refuse. So I became his student. He, he was visiting from Rutgers in Newark. And um, so I, I did my doctoral dissertation with him, finding that, uh, you know, hor implants of uh, c crystals of hormone can actually turn on behavior patterns in animals and reproductive behavior. And, of course, um, we should just make sure the viewers know the hypothalamus is not in the vagina, that's in the brain. In the brain. Oh, you're yeah. You're actually putting crystals of estrogen into yeah, you put part a crystal of the Yeah, put a crystal of, of, of a hormone of sex hormone in the in the hypothalamus of the brain, and it turns on a complex behavior pattern. So um, I found that that's true. But then I wanted to know what is the hormone doing to the nervous system, to the neurons, and the only person doing that was Charles Sawyer at UCLA in the Brain Research Institute. He was the only person studying the effect of hormones on neural activity. So I I did my postdoc with him, and he was studying a particular. Uh, phenomenon called pseudo pregnancy in rats, uh, and that is where vaginal uh, um, the normally the mating stimulus triggers the hormones of pregnancy in in um, in rats. It makes uh, that that it prepares the uterus. It stimulates the secretion of estrogen and progesterone. The mating stimulus. So, stimulates so the, to be clear, you're talking about vaginal penetration stimulating all of that. Well, in, yeah, right. The, uh, yeah, the, so this was a, this was a, a paradigm, like a, a paradigm to study uh, how the stimulation of the nervous system is converted into hormonal, uh, hormonal change. Right. And this was a, a very act, uh, active uh, area, a very big question of what is the connection between the nervous system and the endocrine system? How does it, how does one talk to the other? You know, there are certain species called reflex ovulators, like rabbits and cats, that they only ovulate if they mate. They're not like women who have uh, a menstrual cycle and they ovulate spontaneously. Women are called spontaneous ovulators. Whether or not women uh, mate, I have uh, sexual intercourse, they still ovulate they, uh, every month. But Don't we all know it? <laughs> But rabbits kind of hard and for a cisgender female to miss that. <laughs> <laughs> rabbits and cats don't. They only ovulate if they mate. Oh. Um, and so that's, that's, that's a, 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 a perfect example of how stimulation of the nervous system is converted into hormonal change. And there's a, there's a physical link between the, the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. I don't have to go into those details, but anyway, that was a, a very active area at that time. Uh, this was the 1965, and um, the so in so so Sawyer was studying recording brain activity in response to artificial vaginal stimulation. So artificial vaginal stimulation oh. can produce the same hormones of, of pregnancy in rats, um, and it can be mimicked. The, the mating stimulus normally does that. Uh, uh, um, sterile, sterile mating. If, if the males are sterile, if they're sterilized, if uh, tie the tubes, then they they still stimulate the hormones of pregnancy, but the females don't become pregnant, and it's called pseudo pregnancy. And, and do they do they evidence lactation and, and No, they don't go that far. Okay. They only go about two thirds of the way to pregnant to actual. Pregnancy, but they they actually develop a, a placenta. 
Wow. It's, it's called pseudo pregnancy. Wow. And you can mimic that with vaginal stimulation with using a, a, a glass rod. And to be um, clear, that's what happens in rats and mice, not in humans. Well, w women become, can become pseudo pregnant also. There, oh. is, there, are phenomena, there is a phenomenon of, of pseudo pregnancy in women. Yeah. Uh, not necessarily related to vaginal stimulation. It may be uh, psychological. Yeah, you would, hope, you would hope not because then recreational sex would always lead to a pseudo pregnancy. Right, right. but it doesn't. Okay. So, okay. Um, um, so we were studying, we were studying this, uh, the, the recording brain activity in relation to find out what, which neurons are active in relation to the release of the hormones. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that was a paradigm. That's how I learned how to do brain, uh, the uh, recording brain activity in rats in, in uh, to do any, any kind of brain activity recording from single neurons and, and groups of neurons and EEG. Okay. So right. that's, that was my training. And then when I got back to, I, I was hired back uh, onto the faculty at Rutgers in Newark. And um, when I got to, when I set up my own lab, I decided to continue with those types of studies because there were yeah. some, uh, some interesting questions that arose with, with that research and I wanted to continue it. And so, um, and James Olds, who was the, uh, he was the uh, person who did the research that identified so-called pleasure centers in the brain. And he, so he invited me to come to his lab to look at his rats because he was, he was interested in learning, but he wanted to see, and he developed a way of looking at neuronal activity in awake rats, which was a new technology to be able to record this, the activity of single and multiple neurons, their activity their, um, while the rat is behaving. So, but he had all automated uh, uh, facilities to do study the, the um, uh, the, the learning, and he said, "Just come and look at the rats and tell me what they're doing. You know, can you see any correlation? Because nobody ever had ever done that to see if you can see any kind of correlation between what the activity of neurons and the behavior." And that's what I did. I it, that became one of my first papers. Um, so I, I spent time with it. I learned how to do that. And when I got back to my lab, I started. I combined. I was, you know, you learn these methods. And I wanted to see what happens if, if you do vaginal stimulation, what happens to the neurons in the brain with vaginal stimulation. Uh, but, and now the first time I was, I was working, well, not with, from Sawyer, they were all anesthetized rats doing the pseudo pregnancy. But now I had a weight, I could record the activity in, in awake animals. Okay. The activity of neurons in awake animals. So I did the vaginal stimulation and to my surprise, they suddenly went into the mating posture, the lordosis posture, where uh, they, they elevated the rump and they elevated the head, a right. very striking phenomenon. And they became yes. immobilized, immobilized. Oh. Uh, they were so immobile that just pushing against the cervix with, with the glass rod, they would slide along the table and, and not walk away. They, they were immobilized. They, they would not uh. walk away from the probe. And they would just stand there and I could slide them along the table while they're in this rigid posture. And yeah. I said, it's rigid. What happens if I pinch a foot? I mean, what's going to happen if I pinch a foot? And um, so normally if you pinch a oh, foot of a rat. Oh, they, wow. They, okay. They, so they, they like, become mobile. I get it. This is how we get to the pain management thing. Exactly. So, so uh, normally if you pinch the foot of a rat, they, they pull the leg, they pull their leg away, obviously. Right. Like we would. Right. But during the vaginal stimulation, they were completely unresponsive. They, they didn't move uh, their leg. They didn't squeak. Normally, if you pinch the foot, they squeak and they pull the leg away. With right. the vaginal stimulation, they didn't move at all. They didn't squeak. And I said, are they paralyzed? Are they Can they not move? Or uh, do they not feel the pain or both? So the only way to answer that was I, I did recording of uh, neuro, single neuron activity in the sensory parts of the brain, the thalamus. Right. And I found that to my surprise, I could find single neurons that would re respond to just touching the fur and also pinching the skin. The same neuron, okay. the same single neuron would respond to touching and to pinching. And yeah. uh, when I did the vaginal stimulation, 
it didn't affect the touch, the response to touch. In other words, they start firing, you know, the neurons fire, exactly. they have action potential um, right. when, you, when, you, when they're stimulated. So the, the, the vaginal stimulation had no effect on the touch, but it blocked the response to the pinch. Yeah. You think that it would be the other way around, that if we're just depressing the activity, it would be uh, blocking the weak, the weak stimulus and, and you're letting the strong stimulus through, but it was the opposite way. The weak stimulus came through perfectly, but the pain, the pinch was blocked. So, so what said, you're saying, I, I, just to clarify what you're saying is that basically the rat's neuroreceptors were allowing in pleasurable sensations like petting right. the fur, but exactly. blocking painful sensations like pinching exactly. their feet. Exactly. exactly. Wow. So, uh, you know, I did a, I said, this is crazy. I did a number of studies uh, like that. And I finally convinced my uh, various kinds of studies that I don't have to go into, but I finally convinced myself that the, the vaginal stimulation seems to be blocking the pain. It may also be blocking the, the movement, but it's blocking, the, it's blocking pain and not blocking touch. Yes. I said, so I have this, all, all this fancy uh, physi neurophysiological equipment. And I said, you know, the only way I'm going to know for sure is to ask a woman. <laughs> that yeah, was my right? most scientific, the most scientific way of knowing where the vaginal stimulation blocks pain is by asking women. Uh, hopefully so, 30 of them so you can get a, a sample size there, it, right? Well, exactly. <laughs> um, so, and then that was when by chance, uh, I, uh, Beverly contacted me and I said, why don't you do here, here, you know, I told her about this. She was very interested in it. Yes. And I said, you know, why don't we do, let's do that for your doctoral dissertation. And right. That's, that's what we, that's, and it turned out that indeed uh, we got the, the women with vaginal self-stimulation or cervical self-stimulation with a dildo. We had a, I made right. a calibrated dildo. Um, their, their pain thresholds went way up. In other words, it was, we, 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 we tested their pain by uh, squeezing the finger, having a device that puts uh, calibrated force on the, squeezing the finger. And until it hurts. We say, you know, tell us when it first hurts. And we measured the force. Uh -huh. And then they did the vaginal self-stimulation. And it took, uh, if they're just pressing against the anterior vaginal wall, it took about 50% more force before they said it hurts. Mm -hmm. And if they did it in a way that felt pleasurable, it was more like 75%, uh, it, it took 75% more force. And some of the women had orgasms from the vaginal self-stimulation. And then the uh, it took more than a hundred percent increase in force um, before they said it hurt. And wow. they, but their touch, their touch sensitivity was not affected at all. So in fact, it may be, have become more sensitive. Isn't that amazing? So very receptive to pleasurable touch, but blocking the pain. That exactly. is so. Exactly. I can't, I, I'm sorry, I'm rushing to the finish here, but um, <laughs> we, can, we can back up and, and look at more of the results, but I'm just wondering, did anybody who is working with pain management in women ever take this on as a treatment modality? Well, I had a, 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 a nursing student, a, a student, a doctoral student in the, uh, who was getting her doctorate in the College of Nursing, where Beverly was a, a faculty member, and... Mm -hmm. um, uh, Janice Breen, and she, she studied the uh, women who have chronic back pain, leg pain, uh, and the effect of vaginal self-stimulation on it. And we got very variable results. We, uh, some women uh, had uh, uh, a few minutes of, of, everybody had pain blockage. It, it attenuated the back, the leg or the back pain. Some women, it was a few minutes, but other women uh, was more than a day. And that's a peculiar thing about pain. You know, there are some kinds of pain that uh, they, it kind of uh, works, it, it uh, feeds back on itself. And if you break the cycle, then it's quiet for a long period of time. So it, it seemed like the vaginal stimulation in some women was able to break that cycle and um, keep, uh, reduce their chronic pain. Um, and and uh, so we've seen, so, so, yeah, I mean, it, it seems to work in chronic, in conditions of chronic pain. I, I uh, think it's pain. amazing. And, and, I, and then a lot of women have told, 
a lot of women have told us that um, uh, orgasms can attenuate menstrual pain. They use, they, yes. they masturbate uh, to control menstrual cramps. Of course. And, some and of headache. The, and and but, headache. But Barry, old... <laughs> would you agree though, when we talk about using orgasms to attenuate uh, menstrual pain, that there is some mechanical function in there uh, as far as the contractions of the um, the cervix and the vagina, which could sure. kind of push the menstrual cycle yes. along. Yes, it could be that. that it, it could be a, a multiple factors working, yeah. working in a beneficial direction. Right. And of course, now your research is highlighting how it's, how stimulating both the cervix and the and or is what i'm hearing stimulating the tip of the cervix and or the anterior wall of the vagina was right. that was that pretty specific anterior wall yeah it seems yeah there's something there, there, there's something unique about the anterior wall of the vagina um, because when you consider the structures that are there it's different from the lateral walls and the posterior wall and yeah. we had the best effect from, I mean, the women had the strongest pain attenuation effect from anterior wall stimulation. And that, it's interesting because all the structures, the structures that are in the front, the anterior wall, the, you know, the clitoris, the, the legs of the clitoris um, straddle the vagina. They go deep, but the, the, the external part is just the, uh, the clitoral glands. I'm sure you know that. And the, I, the, yes. the, the crura of the, the uh, of the vagina, straddle the vagina. So if you push on the anterior wall, you're pushing on uh, like it's it's like a wishbone uh, straddling the vagina. You're pushing on the uh, kind of the uh, the joint of the of the wishbone. You're right. pushing, so you're stimu getting clitoral stimulation, and that's also a right pushing against the um, the prostate. Uh, exactly. Which surrounds the the urethra. And women say that the urethral, urethral stimulation can uh, uh, be pleasurable. Prostate, uh, prostate stimulation can be pleasurable. Right. So you're stimulating all these other structures and all simultaneously. And they all may be producing the pleasurable sensations, which also have a, a pain attenuating effect. Right. And, that's and, why, and they're, yeah. all the anterior, they're all in the anterior direction. Not the, the anterior lateral. wall also has the J spot and the um, anterior um, fornix. Those of us in sexology call it the well, erogenous yeah. anterior fornix, but up towards the tip yeah. of the cervix, there is another structure uh, on the anterior wall as well. I don't know if there's an actual G spot. I think that it, it, it's the area and it may be the uh, convergence of all these erotogenic areas that are actually mechanically stimulated when you press against the anterior wall. Yeah. So, so, and I, and um, I know that that the G spot remains kind of a medical uh, controversy, but yeah. would you at least agree that if somebody is stimulating various different portions of the anterior wall, there is a great uh, sexual arousal that can, it, that it can produce. Yeah. But I think it, it's not necessarily simply the anterior wall of the vagina. It may be that when you press against the anterior wall of the vagina, you're also pressing against the clitoral, uh, the, 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 the legs of the clitoris and the urethra and the prostate. Uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah. So, so when, you know, I, I have to say, when I think about all the people that have gotten addicted to Oxycontin and, and, and some of the other powerful drugs that have so many side effects, has it been frustrating for you to not see this more um, publicized so that women at least could alleviate chronic pain uh, by self-pleasuring? Or, or are there pockets where you feel like that's really been adopted? Because I'm, I'm not aware of it. Oh, good. Well, many, many women, I, you know, I don't know. Um, many women tell me that they, they, use, they use the stimulation to... Uh, attenuate their pain. Sure. Um, but what their is doctors, frustrating to the me, doctors aren't what, necessarily recommending it though, right? Well, you know, I think doctors are reluctant to recommend masturbation because they may be, uh, they may get into, they may be afraid that they will get into trouble 
right? Um, for for uh, doing that. So I think the um, they they uh, avoid that kind of uh, uh, advice. Well, um, Jocelyn Elders, the former Surgeon General of the United States, lost her I job. I remember. Look remember what that? happened to her. Yeah, yeah I remember that. Exactly. <laughs> Totally. I yeah, have a so question for you. There's been all this research about uh, where in, in the female, um, cisgender female body can you achieve uh, pain reduction. Did any of this extrapolate to male bodies, to cisgender male bodies? Uh, we, we haven't done any, we haven't done that research, yeah. but, uh, but, um, I think it's likely um, uh, the the uh, what I, I I went you know in in doing my research I, I kept going back and forth um, between women and and laboratory animals to because as questions arose uh, like for example uh, when I wanted to know okay so it, this is a very si simple stimulus. I mean, simple in terms of um, physiology. It's just right. uh, just pressure. Uh, so, uh, what could be the transmitter? What are the nerves that carry the sensation that carry the, that produce the pain blockage? Right. Um, and what what is the neurotransmitter, or what neurotransmitters are released that produce the pain? Can we bottle it? Can we? I, uh, uh, so I actually did those studies after seeing that it does really block pain. The vaginal stimulation. We, I did uh, so a number of biochemical, neuropharmacological studies, where we did in fact identify a, 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 a sensory neurotransmitter in the pelvic nerve. We identified the pelvic nerve by did, doing surgery on different nerves that in, in the uh, genital region. There's the pudendal nerve that carries sensation from the clitoris, the right. pelvic nerve that carries sensation from the vagina and the cervix, the hypogastric nerve that carries sensation from the cervix and the uterus. Um, so we cut those differentially and right. found that the main, the main uh, effect was by cutting the pelvic nerve um, that almost completely uh, prevented the uh, pain blocking action of the vaginal stimulation. And that's okay. actually what got me to, to studying women with spinal cord, in, uh, spinal cord injury because Identify by in, in the rats, I could cut the different nerves and yeah. see which which one is essential for the pain blockage. Right. You can't do that in women. So in women, what I did the the uh, the uh, the corresponding uh, procedure was to study women who had a severed spinal cord at different levels because those three those three pairs of nerves enter the spinal cord at different points. So I could, if I studied the, the, uh, the uh, appropriate levels of the, uh, at which the spinal cord was severed, I could rule out or rule in the different nerves. And that's, that's why I did the study with women with spinal cord injury. Mm. And because having found that it's the pelvic nerve that is the, the critical nerve, I wanted to see, is that also the same thing in women? So what happened in the, the, um, the, the strange thing that happened in women, and actually, actually Beverly and I were working on this and we, had, we were working with a, a physiatrist who was a spinal cord specialist. And I won't name her. I, will name the, I won't name the person. <laughs> All right. Um, and so we were doing, the, I had, so I, I had women with, with um, who had a severed spinal cord at different levels. And uh, what I wanted to do to make sure that uh, we're doing, you know, to, you, you have, you always have, it's always good to have a, like a, a, a drastic condition where everything, the, the women who had a, a severed spinal cord high, highest up, closest to the brain, Right. That would ensure that all the all the known nerve pathways going into the spinal cord they would be blocked from accessing the brain. So those women should have no uh, pain blockage from the vaginal self stimulation. 
And you know, we, again, we were measuring the pain thresholds at the fingertips, you know, the same way we did before, putting pressure on the fingers, asking them when it hurts. Okay. So um, the, 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 what was the big, the big surprise was that my most severe uh, cases, the, the most severe cases where the, the spinal, cord, spinal cord was severed highest up, that should have blocked all the nerves all the genital sensory nerves right. getting to the brain, and that should have abolished the, uh, the pain blocking effect of the vaginal or cervical self stimulation. Those women had the best pain blockage from the vaginal stimulation. I said, this is crazy. How could this be? And it was, it was so crazy that the, our physiatrist left the study because she couldn't, she couldn't figure out you know, she, she said, something's wrong here. And I smell you know, experimenter bias here. <laughs> well, you know, it's, uh, um, you know, I mean, it was very, very distressing. You know, I mean, this is crazy. You know, we, we I made sure that we, we did MRIs and we made sure that the spinal cord is severed. And, and um, it just, I said, look, the only possible way that, this that we can explain this and by the way it was very very there, there were a couple of things were very interesting about that uh, those those women first of all i said you know uh they they, they have i said do you, do you have any sensation below the level of the injury and you know the the physiatrist examined them they, they were you know complete complete injury they had no sensation below the level of the injury, no movement, no leg movement or anything. Um, but they said the only thing they have left is menstrual cramps. Wow. So I said, well, okay, you know, they're feeling, they're feeling something. So it's not just the experimental situation, but they're feeling something. But if, unfortunately, all it is is in menstrual cramps. But then when they said that when they did the vaginal or cervical stimulation, they said they could feel it. And, and the doctors had told them years before that their sex life was over, that they, and so never, they never tried. They didn't have, cl they didn't have clitoral stimulate, cl clitoral sensation because the clitoris is part of the external body, body uh, it's, it's the, it's a somatic, it's a somatic structure as opposed to the va vagina and cervix, which are visceral uh, structures, they're internal structures. So they were oh, having okay. internal sensation, not a, not clitoris, but vaginal and cervical, and so and they burst out crying because they oh. said all these years they didn't know, and oh. and they're they're having they can feel it, they can feel it, and and oh. some of the, some of the women had orgasms from it. Yes, of course, that is astounding. Yeah. So so, I said the only possible way that um, that they can be that this can be occurring. There's only one other possible nerve pathway, and that's the vagus nerve. But the classical view is that the vagus go, goes only down to the uh, abdominal organs, to the intestines. This, you know, it goes to the, the heart, the lungs, goes uh, to, the, to the stomach, the intestines, and some of the right. internal organs. Doesn't go, in, doesn't go as far as the pelvis. And so I said, uh, but that's the only possible way. So first of all, is there any... I, I mean, that's what I said. I have to go back to the rats to see if I cut the vagus, am I going to, am I going to uh, get, am I going to block the response? So yeah. what I did was I mimicked the situation in the women where I cut the spinal cord and showed that, um, and then um, I, I cut the spinal cord and I did vaginal stimulation. And those I had, I looked at a, uh, there was a, a response. One of the effects of, of vaginal stimulation in rats is that the pupils dilate. Uh, that happens in women also during sexual I was, stimulation. I was going to say, yeah, I think yeah, sexual yeah. stimulation does that for all of us. As soon as, soon, as soon as you press against the, press against the cervix, the pupils, boom, they, they open up. Yeah. And so I cut the spinal cord in the rats at very high level, close to the brain, to cut all the genital sensory pathways. And they still had pupil dilation to the vaginal stimulation. 
I said, now, okay, now if I cut the vagus nerves, right. what's going to happen? I cut the vagus nerves and it abolished the response. Wow. And then I tried, then I tried in those rats, I cut, I stimulated the, the cut in the, the, um, the, the uh, vagus nerve, the part that's still attached to the brain. I did electrical stimulation of that and it produced the pupil dilation. So I mean, so that, that told me that vagus stimulation right. can produce pupil dilation. So that gave me the justification for making a proposal uh, to do brain imaging in women to see right. whether the, nuke, the, the, uh, the, the part of the brain to which the vagus nerves project, the sensory input, where does the sensory input from the vagus nerve go uh, in the, uh, it's in the medulla of the, uh, the medulla. I mean, that's known, that's, that's classical knowledge. Um, sure. uh, solitary nucleus. It's a, it's a, it's a group of cell bodies in the, um, uh, in the, in the medulla of the, the lowest part of the brainstem to which the vagus nerve projects. So I said, if the vagus nerve is being activated by the vaginal stimulation in these women with the severed spinal cord, then it should activate that, that region of the brain. And that's how I got into brain imaging. And I, I, I studied the effect of the vaginal or cervical self-stimulation in those women with the severed right. spinal cord. And it, in fact, activated the, uh, the vagus sensory nucleus, the sen sensory projection zone. So that was the evidence that the vagus nerve does carry genital sensation. And some of those women had orgasms from yes. the stimulation. That's, and that's how I got the first evidence of where orgasm occurs in women's brains. That was a world. So I'm making a, I, what? I, I'm making a leap here, but I'm, I'm thinking about people who are, uh, you know, paraplegic, quadriplegic, who are trying to regain sexual access, and it sounds to me like what you're saying is that women who have suffered spinal cord injuries might be able to achieve orgasm if they stimulate their cervix or their vaginal, the anterior wall of their vagina is, am I going too far with that assumption or, or am I in the ballpark? No, here? no, that's, that's exactly, that's exactly, no, it's exactly right. I, I, I'm not sure about the anterior wall, but I'm, uh, the, because the vagus probably um, uh, carry sensation from the deeper parts, like the, the fornix, the deeper parts of the vagina. I'm not sure right. about the anterior wall, but, um, uh, the cervix, definitely, uh, pro definitely the cervix, and probably the deepest parts of the vagina. Okay. So a dildo, uh, uh, a dildo that would stimulate those uh, mechanical stimulation of those regions should should uh, do that. And in fact, or, the fact or that even... those women, the fact that those women had better had a stronger pain blockage, the women with the spinal cord injury had a, a stronger pain blockage than than the uh, then able-bodied women yeah. uh, suggest that there might even be a compensatory pain blocking activity or, uh, you know, that, that the removing the others, uh, the, the input from other regions might actually uh, enable an amplified response to uh, vagal stimulation. This, it's, uh, to me, this is, should be shared wide. And I'm just wanting to know, do you know whether or not uh, treatments for uh, spinal cord injury include anything that would address people's sexual satisfaction? Because you know, I'm when, not aware when, of it. When, 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 we, when we ask the women who, with spinal cord injury, what kind of sexuality, uh, you know, they get, they get all kinds of uh, uh, um, uh, rehabilitation. Uh, you know, uh, uh, all kinds of physical rehabilitation. And w when I said, what, what, was the, what, what was the training, what kind of sexuality training did you get as part of your rehabilitation? They said, well, it was about, and they, they all said about the same thing. They all said it was about uh, 10 or 15 minutes uh, during the bowel and bladder um, uh, program uh, 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 training. Oh. Sad, 
So sad. There's an assumption that people who are differently abled are not entitled to a sex life. And I am hoping that today we are demystifying that and, 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 and bringing to the fore some of the values of sexual stimulation uh, for pain management. Well, and let me, also, let, here's a spec, let me speculate on a value. Yeah, please do. When we, when we measure, uh, when we do the functional MRI, the functional magnetic resonance imaging of the brain, what we're really measuring is um, the utilization of oxygen by neurons. We're not actually measuring, there's no direct measure of, um, of neural activity, what it, it, uh, with neural firing. What it is, is it's um, the, the more active, when, act, when neurons are more active, they utilize more oxygen. And uh, the, the, uh, the fact that they're more active, they release nitric oxide, which is um, the, the neurons that are active release nitric oxide. And that has the same effect as in the, in, in the erect penis and in the erect clitoris, that it relaxes the blood vessels in, in the local region. So that enables more blood to flow to that region. And, um, and what, so what the magnetic resonance imaging does is it, there's a, when, when the, the blood that, that has the iron in the blood is carrying the oxygen, when, when, the, when the oxygen is taken up from the blood by the, by the more active neurons, it changes the magnetic property of the iron in the blood. And that, it, it's like going from um, rusty metal to clean metal. Rusty, oh. rusty iron to because rust is is oxidized, is is oxygen, on uh, you know oxi oxidized uh, uh, iron. Right. So when the when the neurons uh, take the oxygen out of the iron in the blood, it changes the magnetic property of the of the blood. Mm. It makes it more magnetic, and that is what shows up as the image in the functional MRI. The, the change, that very subtle change in magnetic property and in the region where the neurons are active is what we are actually measuring. Right. So what, but what it means is that since there's increased blood flow and there's in, increased oxygen utilization, when we see an orgasm in women's brain or in men's brain, and uh, they, they're very similar to each other, the similarities are much greater than the differences. Uh, the, sim the, uh, the whole brain becomes active, basically. That means that the neurons throughout the brain are using much, they're getting more nutrients and they're getting more oxygen. What could be bad? Oh, oh, I'm, I'm sensing a possible treatment for dementia here. I was... <laughs> well... <laughs> <laughs> You know, they tell, they tell you, uh, take up a second language, take up a musical <laughs> instrument. Uh, brilliant, you know, take brilliant. Up, right. take Sudoku your puzzle, Sudoku puzzles or shuffleboard. <laughs> exactly. Forget that, you know? Exactly. <laughs> well, yeah, no, wow. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to say that. I, I mean, I'm glad that you picked that up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's exactly that's exactly the message that I was trying to convey. Well, I got it. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can say that because I don't I don't have to worry about uh, my reputation. <laughs> <laughs> that is, I I I teach people how to do um, uh, a sacred sexual ritual, self pleasuring ritual. And I'm just, I'm just so fascinated by so many of the health benefits and the emotional benefits of self-pleasuring. Yeah. And um, I'm but wondering- pleasure, if pleasure, you know, pleasure is, it's, it's underrated. You know, I mean, pleasure must be a driving force of evolution because if it didn't feel good, animals wouldn't do it. Yeah. And, and it's- essential for the procreation of the of the species where we have evolved thanks to pleasure 
because if it if it if it was a if what we do is aversive, we don't do it. So, <laughs> and the fact that we're here means that this has been going on for a long time, and all the animals, uh, um, you know, I, they're they they don't do things that don't feel good. Well, we really need to educate the medical system to this so that when they're doing pain management or they're working with people who are quadriplegic or um, paraplegic or have any kind of spinal cord injury, that, that pleasure becomes part of the treatment. Um, would you agree with that? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. There's an interesting phenomenon that many women and men with spinal cord injury have told me that the, this, their skin becomes hypersensitive uh, right at the, at, the, at the level of the injury. And it's just excruciatingly painful if, if, if accidentally uh, the clothing brushes against it or if, if uh, somebody actually accidentally bumps into them. But they say if the right person stimulates it in the right way, it feels orgasmic. Yes. So absolutely. I think there's a there's very, like a, it's kind, very of, kind of a reset intriguing... point. What? So, some of in sexology we call that the reset point. That reset. the um, the body has a natural desire to maintain its ability to orgasm, and so um, and I've I've worked with people who are have spinal cord injuries and have witnessed orgasmic response in the neck and the ears uh, so yeah we actually it's, it's a real it, thing actually studied a woman who claimed that um uh she could have orgasms from neck stim from stimul a, a woman with spinal cord injury who said a high high level injury who said she could have orgasms from her neck from yeah. buzzing her neck uh, vibrating her neck and and we measured her uh, you know her physiological uh, uh, increase in, you know normally is an increase in heart rate an increase in blood pressure we measured that and she indeed had had an org had had an orgasm and uh, from I, from the simulation yeah well i've i've seen it firsthand but i didn't know there was research backing it up that's that's no. astounding yeah yeah well i am is there is there a question that I should have asked you? That's one of my favorite questions when I'm doing an interview is to ask my guests. Is there a question I should have asked you? Um, well, um, it's not a question, but I mean it's something that I uh, since you're talking about increasing pleasure, uh, ways of increasing pleasure. I mean, what, uh, there's an aspect of, of of our research that I think. It gives an indication of, um, of of a rational basis for how to increase the pleasure, how how to increase genital pleasure, and that is that we I, I, we we studied the um, we mapped onto the sensory cortex of the brain the regions where, where do the where does the clitoris, the vagina, and the cervix where do they project in the in the sensory cortex? It's been mapped um, in men, but it wasn't hadn't been done in women. So we we did that, and we found that. Um, uh, the since the different nerves, uh, you know, there's the, the since the, the clitoris and the vagina and the cervix have different uh, sensory nerves, including the vagus. Um, the uh, what we I, I assume that they can all go to exactly the same place in the brain because I mean it's just anatomically there's got to be. So what we found is that they all project to the same general region, a region called the paracentral lobule of the sensory cortex, which is just above the foot region, by the way. Um, you know, because th there's a map of the body on the sensory cortex in the brain. It's called the homunculus uh, or little right. person. And, and the, the, hands are next, the hands are represented next to the face and, the, the, you know, the, and then the trunk and the legs and the genitals down near the foot. Um, yeah. goes over the over the top over down into the midline. Um, so when we mapped, we asked the women to do clitoral or vaginal or cervical self stimulation. And we found that they all go to slightly different places, but it looks more like a, a, a cluster of grapes. And that is that that um, they all there there's a, they all form the same in the same cluster of region. Right. but they're all in slightly different regions and overlapping with each other. 
Now, since that represents different groups of neurons, that means that, and each, and there are, there are reports that some women can have uh, orgasms from cervical stimulation, some can have orgasms from vaginal stimulation, some can have uh, orgasms of clitoral stimulation. So since each of those regions is sufficient to produce orgasm, if you stimulate all of them together, it means you're stimulating many more neurons, each of which can produce their own orgasm. And that suggests that you stimulate them all together and there's gonna be a, a more complex and more intense orgasm because they have different qualities. The orgasms elicited from clitoral or vaginal or cervix have different qualities. You put them all together, they're, they're probably additive. And in addition uh, to that, a big surprise to my yes. ma to me and to my male neuroscientists, but not to my yes. female neuroscientists. Oh, I, I'm, I'm not think. surprised at all. But go on. <laughs> that that we 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 you know kind of uh, try to triangulate this region in relation to the other regions to see how closely it fits the classical homunculus, the classical yes. body map. And so we did finger stimulation and toe stimulation. And, uh, cheek and face stimulation. And also we asked the women to do nipple self-stimulation. Um, so the nipple self-stimulation activated the chest area, which is what I expected. But to my surprise, my great surprise, it also activated exactly where the genitals projected. It was exactly the same region, had a dual, dual positions. And that's what I mean, I, was be I said, you know, and my male colleagues say, well, you know, I guess we have to change the, uh, the classical map, you know, for the nipple. <laughs> and the women said, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes, please do. My, well, I mean, my, my, women, my women neuroscientist colleagues were not surprised. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I know women. I, I haven't, have I come close to it? I think I've come close to having an orgasm just from uh, nipple stimulation. So it's, it's well, pretty intense. <laughs> so well, we and we're finding that we've also mapped the male genital system comparably. Yes. We find exactly the same thing that nipple self stimulation in men activates the, uh, the genital sensory cortex also. Oh, it does. And it does. there's a lot of men that fight that because they they kind of, I don't know. I don't know why. I don't know why, but I, I have encountered men who are like, no, that does nothing for me. And, yeah. and, and then, um, you know, I, I, I have a little joke sometimes. I go, I think your penis disagrees. Um, so <laughs> it's, it's, it's there. It's there. And I, I think it's, it's important for us Hard to realize life. that our, our, sexual, our sexual body is, is a whole body. And, I, and, I, and I'm thinking that your research is really pointing to the, not only the fact that the, the body, if it's not able to use genital stimulation, will find another way um, to be sexual and orgasmic. In, in most cases, I'm not saying in all cases, obviously, because everybody's an individual. Yeah. And, and also how, how important, how central uh, sexual pleasure is to our well-being, whether that's pain management or, um, you know, uh, of pleasure. Just pleasure, producing yeah. pleasure. Yeah. So I would, I, so uh, PS, I would add nipple stimulation to the com combined um, um, clitoral, vaginal, and cervical, yeah. put them all together, and uh, probably the, the orgasm is going to be more intense, more complex, more pleasurable. Uh, yes, it is. And you need two vibrators in that case. Um, <laughs> or, or it works well if you have two vibrators. Or a, or a, a good partner. Oh, uh, really? Uh, <laughs> yes. They need lots of hands and tongues. <laughs> well, Barry, I've really enjoyed getting to know you. And um, after all these years of being enamored with your work, in, oh, in the you. field of sex research. It's just a real pleasure and honor to be able to, um, to dig into your work with you and to meet you in real time. And um, 
Well, I appreciate it. Uh, you know, I appreciate your interest and, you know, to get the word out, that's why, you know, it's important to, to get the word out. You know, there are pub pub publications, magazine articles, uh, you know, uh, interviews, things like that. But, you know, uh, there's still a lot of pressure against um, uh, sexual sexuality for pleasure, for pleasure's sake. And, uh, you know, especially in the medical community. And, and um, yeah. they're still um, very uptight about it. Oh boy, uh, aren't they? And it creates a lot of problems. Um, you know, I've been studying uh, some sexual pathologies also, uh, some, some genital pathologies, that is, and um, genital pain. And um, uh, it's, it's the, the amount of uh, 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 lack of knowledge of, uh, uh, of, of basic functions in the medical profession is really, is really surprising. Yeah. Uh, sad. Uh, it's, it's I mean, sad. What we found, one, one of the things we found is, is that um, this condition of persistent genital arousal disorder where the women uh, and now men also are, have, are, are, can be uh, at the verge of orgasm for prolonged periods of time, mm -hmm. uh, feeling, uh, you know, like uh, an intense uh, genital stimulation itching uh, that they can't they can't act they can't get at it mm. and it just it drives them crazy yeah. and it can go on for uh, days and weeks and months years um a lifetime and uh some women we know have actually committed suicide they, they can't get oh. any any um satisfaction from it oh uh, and so and uh, i found we found two possible two causes and we validated causes one is is um uh, uh, a thing called a Tarlov cyst that forms as a like a blister on the uh, on the genital sensory nerves, the pudendal or the pelvic nerve, um, near uh, where where it just enters the uh, the uh, the pelvic bone, the sacrum. And right. another is um, a, a herniated intervertebral discs, bulging discs, slip oh. discs um, that press on the press on the same nerve fibers as they uh, in their uh, access to the spinal cord. So the irritation of the, of the nerve of, of the pudendal or pelvic nerve uh, yeah. by mechanical irritation or uh, 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 inflammation produces this effect. If we, if we resolve it surgically or uh, uh, well, surgically uh, either right. Re resolving the the cyst or resolving or or reducing the herniation of the disc we we cure the people and um mm. the gynecologists never realize this because they said they're not they're not taught neurology oh my god so you know they assume if there's <laughs> clitoral pain there's got to be something wrong with the clitoris um the, so but but the it's not something and and actually, there's uh, one one case study. Fortunately, just one case study of um, uh, surgical removal of the clitoris because nothing nothing helped. The uh, if if uh, you know if he injected local anesthetic into the clitoris, it became numb. The woman couldn't feel the clitoris, but she still had clitoral pain. Oh. And he couldn't figure out how could she have clitoral pain if it's numb. And so he, he, he surgically removed the clitoris. And, and did she now, still she have had, pain? Now, now she had uh, pain in her phantom clitoris. Oh. It, it didn't help. Oh, because, this is tragic. Because it had nothing to do with the clitoris. It was because the, the nerve carrying sensation from the clitoris was irritated. How and is that way? Oh, my when God. I, when, I, when, I, when I present this to, to uh, clinicians, to OBGYN people, they yeah. go, wow, this is, this is really, this is really uh, good to know because, because uh, we never, we never took neurology. This is terrible. This is terrible. So that the body is a whole organism. It's, I think it's so important to know how everything relates to everything. And I think that's what your work has really highlighted. Um, it, that yes, we might lose access to the clitoris and the legs in a spinal cord injury, but then still have access to um, what's happening in the cervix and the and the vagus nerve. So, right. yeah.
Yeah. Well, thank you so, so much for your valuable okay. and research. Want to bring it to your title. Yes. A lot of women uh, don't tell their doctor, and men also, don't right. tell their doctor about this because they're ashamed to tell them I that know. they have this, they're turned on all the time, or, it, or it's not turned on. They're not, they're not, a sex, they're not erotically stimulated. They're, they're genital, they have genital awareness and, and this uh, incessant genital stimulation that it's yeah. unwelcome and unwanted, but, and they're ashamed to, to tell them. Uh, I, I collaborate with uh, uh, two uh, MDs in, uh, in San Diego, Erwin uh, um, uh, Goldstein and, and Chol Kim. Chol Kim does spine surgery, and he said that um, the, uh, he, most of his work is, is people with back and leg pain, mm -hmm. and he takes care of the, the intervertebral discs. And he said that, I said, well, you know, why don't you put in your questionnaire, do they have any genital symptoms? any genital, any kind of genital system. system. He's finding um, more than, I think he said now, 18% of, of the women who come to him with a back and leg pain say, yes, they have genital, uh, genital symptoms, this, these, these irritation and, and um, incessant uh, stimulation that's very distressing, but they're ashamed to talk to, they, they were ashamed to tell him. Yes. And the only way it came out was by having a, a, a questionnaire that they have to check off. So there's a lot of shame. There is. And that's why this is the shame free zone. Really that's trying right. to, to um, extirpate that shame, heal that shame, and free us right. all of well, it. I, you're doing a great, great work. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining me in the shame free zone today. I've learned a lot and I've had a lot of oh, fun. <laughs> Thank you for uh, thank you for inviting me. It was a pleasure. Total pleasure for me too.